Sets are the most basic data type in mathematics. Uh, it was an insight of a 19th century logician, German logician named Gottlob Frege, that uh, every object in math that comes up could be built out of sets. The integers can be built out of sets, the real numbers, the rational numbers, functions from real numbers to rational numbers, and so on. All can be broken down and described using sets as the basic thing that they're made out of the basic way to represent all these different mathematical objects. So today we're going to uh, review uh, the, some basic concepts about sets and how they work. I uh, expect that this will be review uh, for many of you, but we're going to look at it carefully so we're all on the same page with what a set is and the language that we use for talking about sets. Informally, uh, a set is just a collection of mathematical objects with the collection treated as a single mathematical object. And this is really a pretty informal definition because if you think about it, it's entirely circular. It uses the idea of a collection and that is no clearer than what a set is in the first place. We've already referred to a bunch of familiar sets, the real numbers, the complex numbers, the integers with their corresponding single letter abbreviations in blue. Uh, in addition, there's a concept of the empty set, which I hope is familiar, but maybe not. And that's the idea of a set with nothing in it. It's kind of like a zero with respect to sets. And uh, another operation on sets that builds up new stuff, and it's very important, is called the power set operation. So what I can do is take all of the subsets of the integers, that is every set of numbers like the even numbers or the odd numbers or the prime numbers, which are all a set of elements that are in the integers but not the whole set of integers. And I can take all of those and think of those as a single big set, which is called the power set of whatever set I'm talking about. In this case, it would be the power set of the integers. Standard and simple way to describe a set is by writing out the elements in it. Um, they're usually listed separated by commas and with the curly braces that you see here shown indicating that we're thinking of this collection of things as a set. So this is an example of a set with four elements. Two of them are numbers. One of them is a character string. Uh, that includes the blank, so it's a character string of length nine with the period. And a Boolean truth value, true. Now, a crucial idea about sets is that the order doesn't matter. So if I write down these elements, again, surrounded by curly brackets, but in a different order, it's considered just a different description of the same set. With sets, the order in which the element, there no, is no idea of order in which the elements occur in the set, although in a given listing to describe the set, you would put them in order. A set is determined by what's in it, so uh, the most fundamental relationship concerning sets is the membership relation. So, and it has this notation. I'll say that X is a member of the set A and write it as X little blue symbol for an E, stylized E, uh, is a member of A. And that's red X is a member of A. So let's look at some examples. Pi over 2 is a member of that set that we looked at in the last slide of four elements, one of which was pi over 2. And on the other hand, pi over 3 is not in that set. And I've drawn the membership symbol epsilon or E in red with a slash through it, which is kind of like not equal. It's a shorthand for is not a member of. Pi over 3 is not a member of that set because pi over 3 is neither equal to 7 nor pi over 2, and it's not a Boolean value and it's not a character string. On the other hand, 14 over 2 is a member of this set, the point being that the, the thing that's in the set is the number 7, and 14 over 2 is just a fraction that's another description of the number 7. So 14 over 2 is in that set. So membership is so fundamental, there's a number of different ways of saying it. Uh, in addition to uh, saying X is a member of A, you would also say X is an element of A, uh, or simply X is in A, and uh, those all mean the same thing. Um, so 
let's look at an example again. Seven is a member of the set of integers, is what the first assertion is. Two-thirds is not a member of the set of integers because it's, after all, not an integer. And finally, the set of integers is a member of the power set of the real numbers. Let's think about that for a minute. We think of each integer as just a special kind of real number. So uh, the integers are a set, and every element in the set is a real number, which makes the integers a subset of the real numbers. And that makes it a member of the power set of real numbers, because the power set of real numbers had as members all the possible subsets of real numbers. Membership has a basic property that an element is either a member of a set or it's not a member of a set. It's in the set or it's not in the set. So if I write down something like uh, the set consisting of 7 pi over 2 and 7, it's just a silly notation. I'm telling you the same thing twice, that 7 is in there. So this set, uh, where it looks like it has three elements because one of them is listed twice, is considered to be the same a description of the same set uh, namely, the two element set with 7 and pi over 2. So there is no notion of how many times an element is in a set. There is a generalization that's sometimes used called multisets, where you can talk about that, but we don't really have any use for them. And we're going to stick with mainstream straight sets. An element is in it or it's not in it, and that's the end of the story that you can ask about. Okay, I've been talking about subsets, so let's go back and look at that again more carefully. Um, you denote the idea that A is a subset of B by this uh, round symbol that resembles a little bit the less than or equal to symbol, and maybe that will help you remember it. And it's read as A is a subset of B. It's also sometimes read as A is contained in B. And its precise meaning is that Everything that's in A is also in B. Every element of A is also an element of B. If I wrote it out in formal logic notation, set theoretic notation, I could say that A is a subset of B can be expressed by the following formula of predicate logic in using set membership, namely for every x, x is a member of A implies that x is a member of B. Now, some examples of subset uh, would be that the integers are a subset of the reals. We've discussed that because every integer is a real. Next, the reals are a subset of the complex numbers because every real is a special case of a complex number. You could think of it as the real number plus zero times i. Uh, and another example would be the set consisting of one element, namely three, is a subset of the three element set, which has three in it. 5, 7, and 3. Now, another consequence of the definition is that every set is a subset of itself because every element in A is a member of A, and therefore it satisfies the definition of being a subset. Um, and another idea is that the empty set is a subset of every set. And we can look in more detail about why that's true. So. The reason is that um, if you look at the, if we apply the definition of what subset means, and I am trying to convince you that the empty set is a subset of B, let's look at the definition. In order for the empty set to be a subset of B, it has to be the case that for every x, if x is in the empty set, then x is in B. Well, the thing we know about the empty set is that x being a member of it is false. And that means, by the convention of the way implies works, that the whole implication is true. So this property that, that is the definition of being a subset is true for the empty set. And this is a nice illustration of where the mathematical convention that an implies proposition whose antecedent is false, the whole implies is true, works in our favor and makes the definition of containment uh, work in a nice uniform way for the empty set as it does for sets that are not empty. When sets get complicated or big, uh, you need a better way than just listing the elements of the set. 
it would be impossible if it was an infinite set. And so there's another notation for de describing sets in terms of the properties that characterize the elements in the set. So I could talk about typically the set of elements X in some known set A such that all the elements in X satisfy the predicate P of X such that P of X is true. All of the X in A that have property P and there'd be a special notation for that. It's read this way. Uh, this blue braces are read as the set and the vertical magenta bar is read as such that. So this phrase would describe the set of X in A such that P of X is true. So a simple example of this would be the set of even integers, which I could describe as the set of n in integers such that n is even. Bes besides describing sets using predicates, you can also describe sets in terms of other sets that are known. And there's two very important basic operations that we're going to I'll talk about now for building up a new set from two known sets. So suppose that we have two sets A and B uh, and uh, I'm going to describe two operations for building new sets known as union and intersection. So before I do that let's sort of look at this as a, a, a picture of a classification of all the elements that are in A and B. It's called a Venn diagram for two sets. So the uh, blue shaded area on the left and part, and part of that lens shaped area in the middle where the circles overlap is all of A and B is the uh, shaded area on the right more of a green tint including that lens shaped area so B is a circle uh, and those are the elements describe the elements in B and then there's the stuff that's the background that's in neither A nor B so there's sort of four regions that this Venn diagram cuts up the plane into the things that are in A uh, which is blue, but are not in B, which would be blue without the ellipse, and then B, but not in A, which is the green without this uh, lens shape, and then finally the stuff that's in A and B, which is the lens shape, and the stuff that's in neither A nor B on the outside. The union of A and B is simply the set of all the elements that's in one or the other. So the union is now the pink region which I get by filling in the two circles that represented A and B entirely in pink. Uh, and if I wanted to define it using our set predicate descriptor I would say that A union B was equal by definition to the set of those X's such that X is in A or X is in B. So another basic operation for building a new set out of two sets is intersection. And here I'm showing A and B again and this time the intersection are the elements that are in both A and B, namely the elements in that lens shaped region where they overlap. And if I use the predicate notation for describing sets I could say that X intersection B, we use that kind of upside down U to indicate intersection, is by defin equal, definition equal to the set of X's such that X is in A and X is in B. So we can already notice that there's a close relation between intersection and 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 between union and or. And we can exploit that correspondence uh, to use it to prove some set theoretic identities. So here's a identity, an equality that holds for all sets A, B, and C uh, that involves the properties of union and intersection. And we can read it from left to right as saying that the union of A with the intersection of B and C is exactly the same as the set that you get by forming A union B and intersecting it with the set A union C. Now we get to the point of how do you prove a set theoretic equality like this? 
And we use a basic property that two sets are the same if they have the same elements. So the strategy that we're going to use for proving this set theoretic equality is to show that they have the same elements, in particular that if x is a member of the left-hand set, then it's a member of the right-hand set and vice versa. x is, on the, is in the set on the left-hand side if and only if x is in the set on the right-hand side of the equality for all possible x. That means that the, two, the two expressions are describing sets with exactly the same elements, which means that they're the same set. So here's this identity again, and if you look at it, it looks, first of all, it's a kind of a distributive law. It's saying that union distributes over intersection. You have A union, the intersection of two things, and you form A union, the first thing intersected with A union, the second thing. And in addition, it also looks a lot like a propositional validity that we, or a propositional equivalence that we proved earlier. Namely, that if P and Q and R are propositional variables, then because OR distributes over AND, we have that P OR, Q and R is equivalent to P OR Q and P OR R. So this propositional equivalence in purple uh, structurally, syntactically, is similar to the set theoretic identity in blue, and in fact, we're going to, when we're proving the equality between the two sets described in blue, this propositional equivalence will play a key role in the, in the middle of the proof. And let's take a look at that. So our strategy for proving the set theoretic equality is, as I said, going to be to show that an element x is in the left-hand side if and only if it's in the right-hand side. And this uh, kind of identity lends itself to a very elegant proof by a chain of if and only ifs. We're going to show that x is in A union B intersection C, the left-hand side, if and only if it this, if and only if that, finally, if and only if it's in the right-hand side. And then we will have proved that the two expressions describe sets with the same elements and therefore they describe the same set. So let's start off with the assertion that x is in the left-hand side, x is in A union B, A union B intersection C. And as a first step, we can just apply the definition of union and realize that uh, x is being in that union is the same as saying that x is in A, the first element of the union, or x is in the second element of the union, which is B intersection C. Um, continuing in this way, uh, I can apply the definition of intersection and replace the assertion that x is a member of B intersection C at the end of the second line by the equivalent assertion that x is in B and x is in C. So now I have this propositional combination of assertions of the form x is in one of the basic components A, B, or C. Now it's a propositional combination of these three formulas, I can bang it with the equivalent, the propositional equivalence that this assertion about membership in A, B, and C is equivalent to the assertion that X is in A or X is in B and X is in A or X is in C by the equivalence that we stated in the previous slide. Let's look at that more carefully. So the idea here is to look at this uh, expression on the, on the bottom two lines of this proof and recognize that x is in A acts like the propositional formula P. So let's replace x is in A by P's. And the assertion x is in B we can replace by Q. And x is in C we can replace by R. And now you can see that the transition from the uh, third to the fourth line of this proof was applying the propositional equivalence that we mentioned before. P or Q and R is equivalent to P or Q and P or R. Now the rest of the proof continues again by just applying the definition of intersection and and, this time in the reverse direction. So I've got uh, this propositional combination of membership statements that we've just proved. Now that is equivalent 
uh, by the definition of union to saying that X is in A union B and X is in A union C. I've applied the definition of union to the assertion that X is in A or X is in B. That's the same as X is in A union B. And likewise for the other assertion that X is in A union C. Now I've got an and assertion that X is in these two different, is in one set and another set. So I can apply the definition of intersection and conclude that X is in a union B intersection A union C, which is exactly the right-hand side of the equality that I was trying to prove. I've got my chain of if and only ifs, and the proof is complete. So there's one more operation to consider just for the record. We'll need it later, and that's set difference. So the definition of the difference of between set A and set B is simply the elements that are in A and not in B. And I can illustrate it uh, on this picture with a, a, a bit of ugly PowerPoint, namely that uh, region that I attempted to highlight in orange, that is the part of A that doesn't overlap with B, is an illustration of A minus B. Now, uh, a special case of set difference that actually is even more commonly used is set complement. Set complement is simply the elements that are not in A. It's technically the same as D minus A, where D is the domain of discourse that's usually left implicit and understood. So if we think of the entire slide as the domain of discourse of all the points that might be in A and B that we're considering, then the complement of A would look like this. It would be all the orange region uh, without any of the points in A. And that's the last operation on sets that we're going to consider in this little segment.